Everybody got quiet all of a sudden. I was afraid I was missing something. Good morning. And welcome to worship service this morning, uh, whether you're joining us in person or live on Facebook. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us as we're gathered on this Father's Day. So happy Father's Day to all the dads out there and paternal types. And um, also Juneteenth. Uh, and I, I confess, I kind of knew what Juneteenth was about, but I didn't really know what Juneteenth was about, if you follow me. Uh, so, of course, that's what the internet is for, right? <laughs> so, after I looked it up, and, and I, I, get, I usually look for reputable places because that's the best way to get good information. So, Juneteenth uh, is, of course, short for June 19th. It marks the day when federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865 to take control of the state and ensure that all enslaved people be freed. The troops, arrived, uh, the troops' arrival came a full two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, the end of the Civil War. So uh, that's what this day honors, and it actually only became an official federal holiday last year. So it's, it's, uh, it, when you see people out celebrating or acknowledging it, uh, you're on the same page as I am now, or you, you may be further along than me. So anyway, it, it's, a, it's a good day for great progress and unfortunate that it took two and a half years for it to get there, but it did. So let's see, we've got a few announcements. Uh, we, one of the things I do want to uh, emphasize too is we currently do have going on uh, General Assembly is happening right now uh, for, that's our, every two years, our denomination, you know, we talk about we have church, and technically we don't have a hierarchy, but we have a hierarchy. <laughs> so we have church, and then we go to Presbytery and Synod, and so this is General Assembly. And so this is the annu uh, uh, biannual meeting where kind of decisions are finalized and everything, and you've got... You know, we think we have a lot of committees. No. <laughs> there are so many committees and there's so much involvement. And the beauty of it is the involvement in the people who are doing all of these things are no different than you. You and I. They are people who are moving forward in the denomination and stepping up as far as leadership. That's who they are. They're people who sit in the pews. They're people who come to church on Sunday. Probably not every Sunday, but they're still there and they're still faithfully practicing their faith. And that's what ultimately it's about. It's, it's about our leadership, which comes from within us. So anyway, that's enough about General Assembly. We'll probably have a report at the end uh, once it's concluded just to share with everybody or a link or something so everybody can see what's take what has taken place um, and then I'll just direct you toward the announcements the calendar we do have uh, some fun coming up on the 22nd so uh, come on out to the park I think that's at six o'clock and and I picked up my my chef on Friday so she's gonna fix something for us too Casey's in town <laughs> so uh, I won't be coming empty hand. I won't just bring my appetite this time. So, all righty. So we've got, and we have a lot of different things coming up, uh, and certainly do keep all of these in prayer. And you know, we've we've got continued gun violence going on in the world around us, and uh, and the I just was the my attention was drawn to the. Uh, Episcopal Church uh, that had the shooting in Alabama just a few days ago. Um, so certainly we want to keep them in prayer as well. Any other announcements? Well, y'all are really quiet today. <laughs> Is it because it's so nice outside? Y'all are like, come on, teacher, we just want to go out and play. <laughs> All righty, 
then let us continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we turn and wave to our neighbors. Peace of Christ be with you.
and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful will in, God who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. If you join me. Gracious God, our, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forget the hearts of this eternal today, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that cannot change, open our souls to the future for a new imagination, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your life and in Help us to hear you in the silence, creating in us a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a bright spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us. Resort to us the joy of your salvation and sustain us with your bountiful spirit through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Hear the teaching of Christ. I give you a new command that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love another. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Back in the uh, spring of 2020, we were making plans to celebrate college graduation from high school and Thanksgiving for all that he offered to us during his time in high school as our co-accompanist. Well, if you remember what was going on in 2020, uh, we were not singing. And so that project got laid aside until January of this year when we thought Colin will be home on break the choir is singing again, we'll sing this anthem in January. Well, as you know, the search came in January and the choir was not singing, so the third time is the charm. So this morning, Colin, we're still grateful for his gifts as an accompanist, and we are pleased to sing this anthem dedicated to him in Thanksgiving.
Well, Mary, that was my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> Are we done now? <laughs> goodness. Let's go to God in prayer. Holy One, open us that we may hear you. Silence any voice in us but your own, so that we may clearly hear you and what you are calling us to do this day. Amen. Uh, this, the lesson today comes from 1 Kings 19, 1 through 15, A. Now, I'm going to kind of give us a little preface to the story because it's more than what we have here, as all Scripture is. We always push context. What's, why, how did we get here? Because when it, you know, especially when it opens with, in the first sentence, it says that he had killed all the prophets by, with the sword. Well, I think we need a little background there. <laughs> So what happened was earlier in this story, Elijah has, has been out and about and, and because of Jezebel, Jezebel has been going out and as a way of supporting her prophets who were the prophets of Baal, the wrong God, okay, <laughs> little g, um, then what has happened is she has been killing the prophets of the Lord. And so they've been trying to protect the few that remained as these 450 is what the earlier passages said, 450 of the prophets of Baal. And so Elijah, and some of you will be familiar with this story. It's one of, it's really a, an intricate story because it talks about basically how Elijah is coming forward to declare the Lord is God, period. And so as part of that, he tells Jezebel to gather all of these prophets of Baal and let them build an altar. They can have their choice of cattle, whichever, whichever is best for their sacrifice. And then command Baal to ignite the fire. And so they had the choicest wood, the dry wood and everything, and, and built the altar the way they do, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. But no fire. And so, you know, all the while, I imagine Elijah is just kind of sitting back and, yeah, okay, pray some more. <laughs> As the hours went on, y'all ain't praying enough. You need to pray harder. And so finally he says, okay, my turn. He builds his altar as the Lord commands. And he says, now, not only that, he says, let's dig a trench around it. I want you to dig a trench. Now I want y'all to go over and fill the large jars with water. And I want you to douse the wood on my fire with water. So they do. Okay, no, do it again. And finally a third time until water was filling this trench that was around the fire. And so then, of course, Isaiah prays to the Lord and the altar burns. At this, it's proof in that moment, in that time, that the Lord God is superior to Baal. And so those, are, those prophets of Baal are the ones who were killed as this passage opens. So now, the rest of the story. <laughs> so here we have Ahab. He told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed the prophets, the prophets of Baal, with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more so if I do not make your life like the life of them by this time tomorrow. Her ultimate threat. Then he was afraid. 
he got up and he fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah. He left his servant there, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. And suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. Isaiah looked, and there at his, by his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and he ate and he drank. Then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Oreb, the mount of God. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, not to Elijah, excuse me, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets by the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it split mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel as king over Aram. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Now the bad pun or dad joke, if you will, in me kind of wanted with the sermon title of sheer silence was to sit here in silence for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't sure how that would go over. Some might really like that. I don't know. <laughs> but here we are. So here is Isaiah and what all he's going through in this particular passage. But the thing to remember through this, I mean, I would imagine, I mean, look at what all he's going through in this situation. He's got to feel alone and hopeless. He's got to feel defeated. Think back to that song we were just reading. It's a lamentation. Where are you, Lord? And actually, I really like this part from that passage from, from the psalm. Give me your lantern and compass. Give me a map. 
I prayed for a map from God. Y'all ever pray for a map from God? <laughs> I do it all the time. Still do it. Give me some light. Give me some direction. Open my eyes. I would imagine that is what he's looking for here because he is to the point when he lays down beneath this broom tree, he has given up. As far as he's concerned, his life is over. He has nothing left. He has no place, no sanctuary to go back to, no safety net, no place where he can be rejuvenated. And even when the Lord is telling him, well, go on, well, he's telling him to go on to the wilderness. So in other words, stay out of the mainstream. Be careful. But on your way to being careful, stop off and anoint Hazel as king over Aram. Now, in this text today, when we're looking at it, and we start thinking about what it means is, is, is to remember that God is merciful and powerful enough to conquer evil and to redeem hopelessness. Because that's where Isaiah was under that broom tree. He had given up. But God didn't come to him in a loud, bold way But in the silence, in the stillness, that's when God is speaking. That's when God is leading. That's when God is revealing God's self to those who are hopeless. As we, you know, it's not what we want, though, is it? See, God comes to us on God's terms, not ours. As we also say, Things happen in God's time. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing. We don't like that either, do we? It's uncomfortable. Because we want somebody who's just going to, you know, like, like when you're a kid and you're fixing to touch the hot stove and, and your mom or your dad just say, stop. That's what we want. We want God to do that. We want God to interrupt our lives and redirect us so that we don't have to go through that suffering, that pain. But that's not who God is in all of this. God's with us there in our pain. God is with us when we get to that point of hopelessness. God remains with us. And sometimes it's only in that hopelessness that we get really still. That we listen. That we realize we're not allowing ourselves to hear God because we needed another distraction. We needed another thing. Another, And sometimes that's an important part of healing. But then we also get to that point of healing some. And then it's a matter of, but now I need to listen for God. When I, I was going through a difficult time, and I may have alluded to it in the past, but when I was going through a difficult time for me, uh, I spent a lot of time at the beach that particular summer. Um, well, God worked it out for me. I told God to put me somewhere where I could really listen, where I could really uh, restart, where I could get away and rediscover who I am. And when I did, I could hear God again. I reconnected. I recognized the path that God was putting before me and moved forward. So I wonder in this, you know, I can kind of feel what Isaiah is going through. You know, he did some bold stuff in these few chapters in, in, uh, in 1 Kings. He did some extremely bold stuff. And so I kind of wonder, 
Did he overreach? You know, maybe that's what he's feeling. Maybe that's why he feels hopeless. He feels like he overreached. And, and when we do that, oftentimes, that's not what we're supposed to do. So he might have felt distanced from God in that time. So here, God is reassuring Isaiah. No, no, no. You didn't overreach. You were zealous for the Lord. You did the difficult thing that seems, well, let's be honest, it seems a little crazy. <laughs> One person going up against the 450 plus the government that's in cahoots with the worshipers of Baal. He had everything stacked against him. The only thing on his side was his faith in God. And his faith in God didn't fail him. And so when we wonder sometimes and we, we, we get worried about what it means when uh, religion starts strongly influencing government, that's what it looks like. Because when this one was in charge, the worshipers of Baal, they were trying to extinguish all worshipers of the Lord. That's what they do. They don't want to live in harmony with one another. One seeks to extinguish the other. So it took a bold move from Isaiah to step up, to expose himself, and in doing so, take care of God's own people. Because he didn't do it for himself. He was doing it for God's chosen people. Now, we may wonder, so uh, in our own lives, how does this fit in? How does this work for us? How does this idea of sheer silence fit into our busy week? That's the problem, isn't it? There's no exact equation for that. There's no exact, well, I've got to sit and listen for God so God can give me that map and lantern and compass. We have to be still and quiet enough, long enough, so that we can experience what God is communicating to us and be transformed by it. That's the hard part. Because of devices like two of them that are sitting right here on this pulpit, it's too easy to distract ourselves. I can't tell you how many times I'm like, oh, I need to look this thing up. And I go on the internet and I start flipping through and it's like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I, and before long, I can't remember what I was looking for in the first place. So sometimes we just have to take these things, set them aside, turn off the TV or the radio, and allow the silence. To allow the silence can be uncomfortable. But nobody said opening ourselves to God was a simple thing. If it was, everyone would do it, right? So we have to be willing to set these things aside, to listen, to experience. Sometimes that time of silence may only be that. You might not hear God in those moments, but you had some quiet time. You let your mind rest. We talk about that, uh, you know, when we, when we have, we look at things like the bulletin. We could probably squeeze all of this information on about three or four pages. But there will be no white space. No place for your eyes to rest. Well, think about what we're doing to our minds. Treat your mind that way. You know, don't, don't cram it so full of everything that there's no white space to just kind of sit there and be for a moment. 
There was a, a worship service. I, I won't name the church, but it was one of them in Atlanta that I would attend while I was in seminary. And from the moment the service started, it felt like somebody clicked the stopwatch. <laughs> As soon as the choir was done with their thing, the children were already here with the thing. And so as soon as they hit their last note, and uh, good morning, boys and girls, we're here this morning. And, and they did the, ch the children's thing. And then as soon as the children's thing, then the next hymn. And then there was never a quiet moment. You were bombarded. I was tired by the end of the service and I was in the congregation. <laughs> it was exhausting. Similarly, when I, you know, I love going places like Disney, but there's so many, oh, I, I thought about it when we first started going, I thought about it one time, I was like, you know, it doesn't matter, I, I, I started testing myself, I said, you know, I wonder, if there's anywhere I can go in that park where there isn't music playing, the answer is no. <laughs> I looked everywhere. <laughs> Every, everywhere that I walked to, they had music, and, and it was cheerful music. It was meant to keep you in a good mood. It may be to keep you distracted from anything that could be weighing you down. I understand why they do it, but as someone who appreciates the silence, I missed it. So friends, I encourage you this week, just take some time. This is... This is as much as anything about our own personal journeys in faith, as much as anything about how we live our own lives and we want to improve our relationship with God. So from this, give yourself, you know, out of this week, maybe one evening of setting technology aside, turn off the TV and just be, just exist. Just revel in the goodness that is God. Pray. Open yourselves up. Maybe ask God for a flashlight, a compass, and a map. Amen? And I hope you find it. <laughs>
please remain standing as we join together in our affirmation of faith, which is taken from a brief statement of faith. So what do you believe? In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. We trust in God, whom Jesus called I, Father. We trust in God, Holy Spirit, wherever we With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God. In Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Now I would ask if we have any additional prayers, prayer requests, and we've got Larry with the microphone. Prayers for my mom, Elaine, who's going through a hard time. Oh, wow, Elaine. Any others? others. Then let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you are bigger than big, larger than large, and more awesome than awesome can describe. We gather to give you thanks for your presence in our lives and for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the movement of your Holy Spirit among us. So, Lord, you hear these prayers that we lift today. So we pray especially for Elaine, that she can feel better and stronger, and for Jack, overcoming cancer and the recovery that goes along with it. And for Tim, Lord, we pray. We pray as he and so many fight to overcome COVID. So, Lord, we pray for Tim, but also for all those who have that struggle and for their loved ones who also share in the struggle. And holy God, we pray for the Episcopal congregation in Alabama that you can bring them comfort, that you might bring them hope that when they gather in worship, that all that they do is, is in your name and know that everything that we do is as one church, one body, and as such, we lift them for you. So, Holy One, we pray also for all victims of gun violence and their loved ones. We continue to lift, praying for peace in the Ukraine, healing for Pam, 
And Lord, we pray for all our friends, family, and loved ones who are in need. We pray for victims of all disasters, whether natural or man-made. And we lift to you first responders, all those in our armed forces. Lord, all of those who seek to bring your peace, all of those who rush to preserve life where life is being threatened, we pray. We pray, Lord, that your peace may be felt by all. So now, Lord, O oh great God, we are grateful for you, for your love, for your Holy Spirit, and for your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now I invite Carolyn forward. Good morning. Good morning. It's so appropriate as you talk about sheer silence because in this challenge of sharing the story which we've been doing over the last several months, it took a lot of silence and, and listening. 1970, John and I moved here with our young family. 50 years ago, I just did the math. That's a long time and that's a lot of memories. And so that I don't go into too many details yet, I want to share the walk with you a little bit down memory lane in this church with those of you that have been through some of those years. And those of you that are new to our church, these are some of the things that have happened. Our family moved to Marcellus in the fall of 1970 when my husband John accepted a teaching and a football coaching position here. I'd previously taught elementary school in both Nyack, New York and Cortland, New York, places some of you have been. But now I was a full-time mom to two-year-old Robin, a homemaker, a community volunteer, and expecting our daughter Jennifer in June. Since I was raised in the Methodist tradition and John was raised in the Presbyterian, we explored both options here. We soon decided that Marcellus First Presbyterian was the place where we wanted to raise our young family. And two and a half years later, our son John was welcomed into the family. Joining this church was a decision that we never regretted. Over the years, John and I have taught Sunday school, been a youth advisor, sung in the choir, played piano for our youth choir that used to sit in that loft gone camp camping with other church families, been on and chaired numerous committees, served on our session, both of us, baked casseroles and enjoyed delicious desserts, too numerous to mention for all church dinners and events that we've joined over the many years. All three of our children were married in this church and still retain many fond memories of all their years here and the strong foundation they developed as a result of their many experiences and the excellent teachers that they had. Personally, our church has afforded me with many opportunities to carry out the word of Jesus Christ through the many activities where I could reach out to others, just as our t-shirt says we had our faith out into the world, and to serve things like the Samaritan Center, Habitat for Humanity, those delicious dinners, Marcellus Child Care Center Board of Directors, Marcellus Food Pantry, and goes the list goes on. Many of our lifelong friends and special bonds have been formed here. And that's been one of the most, I think, significant parts is the friendships that we form. Through this church, we both continue to be challenged to practice our faith and to grow and learn. Being a member of the choir for the last 20 plus years <laughs> continues to bring me great joy each week, both at weekly practice, and Alan is a wonderful director to have, and on Sunday mornings. Without a doubt, being a member of this church has been and continues to be one of the most important aspects of my life and for our whole family. Thank you.
And now, as God has been gracious to us, it is our time to share a portion of that in our gratitude. So let us receive our tithes and offering. Blessed are you, God of all creation, through your goodness and share. Accept our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. So now, friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. 
Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen.